Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to Event Tech Talks. We should be now streaming uh, live out to the entire global event tech industry, as well as to our gathered audience here at the fabulous Huckle Tree facility um, in the east central part of London. Um, if you've not been here before, I, I recommend you come down. It's a fantastic facility and great to be hosting the very first Event Tech Talks here today. The subject of today's first session is how is technology changing the attendee experience, the people that are coming to our events and ultimately the people that we're all shooting and rooting for. Um, let's welcome our panel on today's first session. Steve Richard Spong from Zappa, welcome along this afternoon. Good to have you aboard. Ross Easterbrook from Sledge. Ross, good afternoon. Uh, James Lawrence from Doozer. James, good to have you along. And Carl Bresnahan, Interglow. I told you I'd get the surname right. Is it spot on? Um, Guys, thanks for joining us. Let's dive straight in there. How is technology changing the experience? Let's first of all look at who you are individually and what your organisations do. So a very, very quick overview to put it in context for our audience, please. Let's start with you, Stephen. Tell us about Zappa. Okay, so Zappa is a provider of augmented reality um, infotainment experiences, we call it. Um, so uh, we specialise in, in augmented reality that is code-based um, and... Uh, across a, a wide variety of verticals and events is, is one of those that I head up. Um, yeah. Let's move it along. Okay, so I represent Sledge. We're an event agency and a video production agency, and we specialize in the areas of, um, sort of internal comms, experiential, and really bringing together disparate and quite complex sort of cultural uh, events. James Lawrence from Doozra, tell us about Doozra. Uh, Doozra is basically a combination between an event app, uh, a presentation tool, and an audience response system. Uh, and the idea really is that it gives the delegate the ability to interact with the event um, in a way that perhaps they weren't able to before. And the ability for it to be used as a presentation tool also means that we can change the format of some of the, some of the events that we get involved with so that they become more experiential uh, and, and less, less based around the standard sort of everyone sit at, at the back and, and watch the presenter. But that's, that's what we do. And Carl, Intego. Um, so we're a creative agency with a focus on uh, holograms, so looking at new kind of engaging ways to get people involved in events and retail in particular. Perhaps we should start by looking at is there a need or, or why we should be changing the, the attendee experience? Um, just because the technology is there, should we necessarily be changing what may already be Good events. Let's begin with any of you if you've got any thoughts on, on why and if we should be changing events and how we identify whether or not there is a need to do so. I mean, from our perspective, I think that the, there's two parts to whether you need to use technology at an event. One is the delegate experience, clearly, which is very important. But there's also what is the organiser trying to get from the event. And so I think that until relatively recently, the amount of information and data that you could capture at an event was very limited. So you were relying on things like a, a printed feedback form and maybe you know, some sort of uh, fairly rudimental polling. So I think as well as enhancing the delegate experience, event technology is, is allowing organizers to get the same sort of metrics that they might do out of other digital tools uh, and then be able to use those metrics to, uh, to give, the, to give the, the event some value and actually to give it some ROI and, and make it useful to the business. So I think that it's, it's not just about the delegate experience, although that's very important, but it's also in giving the organiser what they need from the event and, and giving them a reason to spend what they spend on events. So b b before we start delivering then um, a, a, a new attendee experience, do we have to be giving the organiser a new experience before they can actually deliver something new for their guests? Um, I don't think so. I, th I think I think from I think my my perspective is very much from from the agency side of things. So we obviously have to communicate what our client wants through to their end audience. And if technology is suited to that um, to that journey, then then we'll use it. But we're in a lovely situation that we're not tied to a particular technology. We're not. We're not th thinking. Okay, we've got to shoehorn this in at every at every turn. So, if a hologram is is the way to go to have that big sort of wow sensation, or to, or to bring a bring a story to life, or, or whether it be an event app or, or whatever the situation may be, then we can. Then I think we can choose the right technology to to deliver 
what the client wants. And, and ultimately, I think the best route is to start with what the client wants as the outcome and essentially work backwards from there, whether that's wow or whether that's uh, metrics or, or whatever the case may be. Um, one of the things that was mentioned in the synopsis of today's uh, of, the, of this particular session was was augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, when we put the information out there ahead of today, um, a question has already come in, which I'm going to put to you. Perhaps maybe Carl, maybe we can bring you in on this one. Um, is virtual reality a passing fad or the next big thing? Um, I believe that it is. It's not a passing fad. I think there are alternatives, like the Hololens, which is the Microsoft kind of uh, augmented reality hologram that you can create with, a, with another headset. Um, I like virtual reality because obviously it, it allows you to give a different experience, but it blocks you off slightly uh, from everything around you. I think the most important part to actually kind of keep virtual reality moving forward will be uh, the content because it kind of started to grow in the 90s and kind of started to dip down slightly and that was just basically because of the content. And if we can keep the content moving forward and get to a level where actually you become more and more immersed, looking at, um, at sorry, immersed, um, and kind of uh, integrating other technologies, like there's a technology called a Leap, which uh, attaches to the front of the uh, VR headset, which allows you to use your hands within VR, then I think that could be a way that it can move forward and keep developing. I don't think it's just necessarily about VR, but kind of bringing it out to a broader range of kind of technologies and bringing it all to one. I, I, sorry, I was just gonna say, I think the, the problem that I, I find with with augmented reality, sorry, uh, with uh, with virtual reality rather, <laughs> is that in the events industry, the the idea is ultimately that, that we want to network and we want to sort of engage with each other. And whilst I've had a go on 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 uh, virtual reality headsets and, and 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 been blown away by it, what I found to be the biggest problem is the the isolating factor of it and. And I'm not quite sure how virtual reality can can break through that that barrier to to, to become mainstream within the event industry in a in a conference sort of setting. I think that's kind of my, my biggest question mark over that. Yeah, I think that a conference setting itself, so um, you know, if you take a trade show whereby um, people are trying to explain, uh, uh, I don't know, spaces or products that they're not able to sort of bring to that venue, it's, it's all about the, con you know, the, the context mm. at, at the end of the day and, uh, and the result that you're trying to um, achieve. And I think that VR has a, a, a very large role to play in terms of um, taking people into an experience that otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't be possible, um, especially at trade shows and if you're selling products. Yeah, I wonder whether or not it will become a um Part of not not necessarily for the the live audience here, but for the actual the online viewers today. You know, the, with a 360 camera and the ability to mm. to plug in, whether or not actually it will make virtual events more engaging as well, a result. We've already seen examples, haven't we? I mean, there's a there's the, the Paul McCartney video on on YouTube, which was, yeah. was was an early sort of it generated a lot of interest in, in in the potential of using something like virtual reality to put people in in a virtual audience, in essence, isn't it? And not only in the audience, but on the stage in places that you could never go to realistically as an audience member. Um, so when we talk about changing the attendee experience. Using that as an example, are we in a scenario now where we can actually be using the technology that's available to us to put attendees at any type of event into situations and particular scenarios that just before weren't, weren't feasible to practically and physically put them in there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think to your point, uh, agreeing with the client in, in advance what it is they're trying to achieve is the most important thing because there's a whole range of technologies out there that do all sorts of different things. And so really, it, by agreeing those objectives, then you can decide which tool is the best one for the job. But I can certainly, we do a lot of pharmaceutical conferences where you may have a main plenary session in the morning and then you might break out into smaller sessions. Um, certainly the use of AR or VR in the, plenary, in the breakout sessions to give people those experiences that perhaps it would be difficult to bring to that live conference venue, I can certainly see a lot of value in that. And I can certainly see that as a way that that technology may, may we may be able to use that technology because we do a lot of these sort of perhaps more serious type meetings which aren't about getting content out onto social media, aren't about you know, the, big, big, the big sort of bells and whistles. It's more about maybe creating a very effective learning environment or making sure that people are being trained effectively. Um, so I can certainly see the use of that uh, as playing part of, of those conferences where there is a, an agenda where you want to try to get people to retain information. And I do wonder whether or not that w what we'll see is, a, is a, essentially a division of, of B2C and B2B 
type events where certain technologies naturally fall much more into one camp or the other. So with Steve's sort of aug augmented reality, there's a there's a natural consumer uh, um, offering that, I, that that we were sort of discussing before, and I wonder whether or not that we'll, we'll, we'll kind of see that, that polarisation of the uh, of the events industry. Just before I move on, Stephen, if I could just ask all the guests to just speak up a little bit down these mics, just make sure that everybody in the audience today can hear us through the speakers as well as uh, the guys tuning on the live stream. Stephen, uh, when we look at a technology like Zapper and how it's being integrated and can integrate with uh, other event apps as well as being a standalone platform itself, mm -hmm. um, have we made better progress with the augmented reality side of the attendee experience than the, the virtual reality side at the moment simply because we've got some of the most simple tools for augmented reality already in our pockets and have had for a few years now. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, there's no question that the proliferation of smartphones, um, uh, you know, every, everyone seems to have the, uh, the, the ability to, to view augmented reality con content um, at a conference. I'd say 99% of people will have a smartphone. But um, in terms of the proliferation of VR devices, um, even, you know, the, the predictions aren't in the billions, they're still in the sort of tens of millions uh, leading up to, to uh, and hundreds of millions leading up to 2020. So, um, yeah, early phase with VR. Um, I think that it's good to concentrate on what's possible right now. Uh, people often, oftentimes sort of get caught up with um, uh, always focusing on, on the future and what, what's going to be the next big thing. But we've got some fantastic technology that's available right here. Let's just very quickly ask our audience, how many event organisers are in the audience today? Put your hands up if you're responsible for organising events, meetings, conferences. Who has looked into augmented reality and virtual reality? Who has reached a sticking point when it comes to budgeting for that particular technology? Okay, a few tentative hands up there. So we've had a question, that, uh, quite simply, how, how much does it cost to integrate VR and AR and how do you budget for it? Because inevitably, when new technologies are brought to any industry, there is that finding of feet and finding how you actually deploy it and finding the money to do that and justify changing something that perhaps has worked for a number of years. How are you guys working with clients in order to justify the, the cost of deploying some of this technology? Um, I think it all comes down to uh, finding the right content for the client, like mentioned before, but then working out together, which is what we've found is like with, with the holograms, for example, you can add interaction, you can add payment systems, but then working to a budget and working the, the right content in. But again, uh, if you're not uh, spending the amount to get the good quality, then you end up with a piece of VR or, uh, or AR, which isn't right for the, uh, kind, of, the kind of consumer. And then that's when you have the problem of, uh, yeah, you, you have to spend the right amount of money to be able to get the right quality, basically. But I think, yeah. sorry, I was just going to say, I think that's the same with really all technology. Um, it's got to, you've got to budget for, for it to be fit for purpose. Um, you know, there are, if you look at the, the event app industry, where there are just hundreds of them, you know, there are some that are free, which are fit for purpose for Certain certain types of events, and then there are ones where you'll spend tens of thousands of pounds to deliver, you know, ri ridiculously amazing experiences at the other end of the spectrum. Um, and I think I think that's kind of the same with 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 all technologies. But I think it's not just necessarily the price; it's also the associated risk with new technologies. And you, you to a certain extent, you have to have the the trailblazer client who is determined to always be mm. first to market and be prepared to take that risk. You know, and we don't all have the budgets of Facebook at World Mobile Congress where they hire 300 Oculus sets to, to, for every audience member. Well, well on, on, on that subject, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to ask, when you, when you come to deploy it, and you mentioned how many different types of technology are available now, whether that be um, event apps, whether that be websites, regardless of what the technology is, there's so much out there. When you have a proactive event organiser wanting to change their attendee experience for the better, does the minefield of technology that's out there actually give them the risk and, and run the risk of them choosing something that's wrong and giving a negative attendee experience? How do we differentiate between what's good and what's bad and how it could be integrated? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that there, is, there can be a tendency to use something just because it's available. Uh, and I think that sometimes that's why, it's, it, again, to your point, 
the agreeing at the beginning with the client what it is they're trying to achieve is so important and then looking for the right tools in order to meet those objectives rather than just using things out there because they're available. And, and there will be certain people that just want to continually push the envelope and do something new because they, they did something last year and now they want to do something new. Um, we try, uh, when we're talking to, to our clients, we try to get them to move away from just chasing the next big thing to understanding that there's been a step change away from printed material at events. Uh, and event technology is, is, is here to stay and it will continue to evolve. And, and in some ways, people have to, event organizers have to catch up with themselves a little bit and to understand exactly what they want to achieve from using event technology um, and, and, and not necessarily continually, like I say, look for the next big thing or, or the next you know, bang, you know, big bang uh, product. Um, so I think that, yes, there's a minefield of technology out there, but by making sure you have a conversation with the client about what it is they're trying to achieve, then you can make sure that the tools that they're selecting are right. And we will walk away from work if we don't believe our tool is the right fit for that particular client. Um, when we look at examples of it, we're all moving at a slightly different pace. Everybody will be going, you know, either hell for leather to, to deploy this or dipping a very tentative toe in the water to have a look at it. Um, perhaps we could ask our panel of some really good examples of augmented reality and virtual reality places and events that you've seen stuff deployed. And it doesn't, I think it's important that we should remember, it doesn't have to be, be mind-blowingly technologically advanced. It can just be the, you using technology in its simplest form to change an ever so slightly small element of that event for the better. Let's look at some examples. Let's go around the table. Stephen, let's start with you. Sure, okay. So in terms of uh, a particular exhibition stand, um, we worked with HLM Architects at a, an event called MIPIN. Um, and uh, allowed their, their sales representatives to demonstrate to uh, visitors um, some modular space. So they had a, a large graphic panel at the back of their stand. They used iPads to scan this, and then the, the wall sort of seemed to, to peel away, and then you were able to sort of view and modify the space behind that, that panel through the iPads. And vis visitors to the stand could also access this, these visuals um, on their mobiles as well. Um, in terms of a, an event-wide solution, we worked with a, a, an event called Millennial 2020, uh, whereby, uh, you know, at the lower end of the, the, the scale in terms of the, the activation, um, we just facilitated lead generation. Um, people would scan badges, as you would do a QR code, but the experience was, was again, it, rather than being screen relative, it was actually relative to the badge. So the badge came alive in the, in the viewer of the phone and just added a little, uh, extra magic to the occasion, it looked like the event was properly branded and the, the digital side of things was properly considered as well. And we'll come on to you, Ross, then some examples from you. Yeah, so I come, come at it from, a, from an agency, so, so I come at it from an agency perspective and um, I have to say the clients that we work with who are generally sort of Fortune 500 type companies aren't there yet in terms of AR and VR. So we are very much still at the uh, live audience engagement, maybe live streaming, definitely the event app, and you know, the, the usual call from a, from, a, from a director or someone saying, we should have an event app. Great, what do you want it to do? Ooh, we don't you, know. We don't know, yeah. So that's kind of a default starting point. Um, that said, we are working on a couple of projects uh, around the world at the moment where we will see our sort of, the start of clients starting to use more augmented reality than virtual reality um, and more in the exhibition space to bring, as Steve was saying, the, the, the stands to life rather than it just being a, a, you know, a very static, a static entity. Yeah, exactly. It's so. been traditionally, yeah. James, let's come on to you. Some examples, please. Well, we, as a business, we don't really do AR and VR, um, although certainly from understanding what our clients are trying to achieve through their events, I can, I can see a place for both AR and VR. I mean, we've, we've worked before with AR whereby you'd visit a, an exhibition stand, you'd, you'd have an, an AR marker there that you could then scan, and then it would bring up some relevant content. And I think certainly that has a place, and there's a clear... For this particular client, there was a clear ROI, as they wanted to make sure that everyone had visited this particular stand and they'd, they'd followed a course through the exhibition. And so we were able to use AR, uh, not our technology, but an AR partner, to just prove that they'd visited each of the stands and so give them some ROI on that. So as a business, we don't really do AR and VR, but certainly I can see partnering with people who do provide that for certain conferences moving forward. 
And Carl, I guess you've got some good examples. <laughs> yeah, so um, in January we went to CES, we worked with Flexotronics um, on, uh, to basically communicate the idea behind their product. So uh, it was a wearable tech, uh, two wearable tech garments, and the idea was that you can't actually wear it because it's on a, on a trade show, and how do you communicate that? So we used holograms to kind of demonstrate that. You don't need to have staff there. You can kind of um, expand information out of the, out of the garment. Um, and that was incredibly valuable that it doesn't need to have anybody there repeating over and over again about the product and you can give it a completely different perspective and kind of tell the story behind the product. Um, but then on a completely different end of the scale, I was at an event uh, last week called PsychFi and the same kind of impact was that uh, it was a small uh, Google Cardboard headset with just some really cool visuals and it just creates a really good energy and uh, kind of excitement around it. Everyone wants to come and try it. And I think that is also an incredibly valuable tool on a lower end kind of uh, scale of cost. We've had some examples here. Um, I believe that we've got some audience mics ready. So for uh, our audience members who are gathered with us today, has anybody got any questions that they would like to put to our panel? Hands in the air and we'll bring the mic to you. Who have we got? Please don't all rush forward at once with questions. Nobody's got anything that they would like to ask that relates to technology and changing the attendee experience of your events. There's the value of the event app. They can ask by the app. It's one of our big selling points. <laughs> there we go then. Talk about the value of it because if we are talking about event apps and changing the attendee experience, I've, I've, I've seen a number. Right, we've got one over there. We'll come to you. We'll come to you one second. But on, whilst, whilst you mentioned event apps, I've seen a number of examples where I've been to events and the event apps have been terrible. Yeah. And that's a perfect example of changing the attendee experience for the negative because it's actually created a worse experience than you had previously when it was just a traditional either registration or printed document. Um, how do we actually negate when somebody's had a, a bad experience? How do we come in and actually change that and convince them that stick to the idea but perhaps change this? Yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to just deciding what you want to achieve. Again, I know I keep banging that same drum, but the, um, you know, the point that you just had a very good example of there is that you've got an audience of whatever that is, 40 or 50 people, and you've asked for a question from them and no one's put their hand up, um, which is very typical. Um, and so, you know, if you, this is a fairly intimate audience, so it's quite easy to go around and bully people into asking a question, but if this was three or 400 people, then the chances are you'd, you'd be scratching around looking for questions right now. Yeah. With an event app, you, um, I b believe they've come in real time from the audience or from your bigger audience. But you're able to gather these questions so people who are not comfortable putting their hand up in open forum, which is a lot of people, they're able to ask their questions. Now, you may decide that you're going to use them now at the end of the session in order to answer, uh, you know, into, into keep creating an interactive environment. Or you'll be able to take these questions away and you'll be able to use them for your marketing post-event or be able to use them to communicate with the people one-to-one. -one. So there's a perfect example there of how the event app could have add value to or will add value to this particular event. And that if you only use that feature, then you'll have got some value out of that event app. You don't have to use every feature that's available within the app to have actually got some value there. I think, I think from an agency perspective as well, um, I'm just historically, and I, I've worked for other companies where I've sold event technology as well. So I kind of ha have worked on sort of both sides of the fence, as it were. Um, I think the, the best way of introducing technology that, that I found over the years is to do it in very gradual steps. So you may have an event app that can just do everything, but it's so simple to change the code for it to be paired right down. So potentially starting with just live voting and, 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 and Q&A, but then to maybe introducing the agenda and um, the ability to swap business cards, and then the next year adding modules and modules so that people feel more comfortable um, as, as they progress. And I think, I think to avoid that sort of negative experience, it, that's a very, very safe way of doing it, and it tends to get more and more people's buy-in uh, as they go. Let's come over to the question. We had a gentleman over here who put his hand in the air with a question. If you could just uh, give us your name and where you're from, please, sir. Ben Hoff, uh, Velo Partners, a venture capital firm in London. I'm just wondering, we often see in um, some of the event tech, particularly the ticketing businesses or the uh, event management um, uh, SaaS sort of businesses, that a lot of their business models are predicated on upselling things like tickets. Uh, there's ones we've seen pre-ordering uh, refreshments and those sorts of things. And I'm wondering if you've had any experience with whether those add-ons have been successful or whether the core business model actually needs to stand up on its own. Guys, do we have any thoughts on that? 
From my perspective, I think it needs to stand on its own. I, I don't think you can generate a business predicated on on the on the extras. I think if those extras aren't the right extras, then you've got no business left because you know you're broke. Um, I think there are some. I think you kind of have to look at those value at those add-ons as I guess revenue accelerators. Um, I know that, I can't remember the name of the company, um, but they, 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 there's an app that is used a, a great deal for festivals, and they use uh, Beacon technology so that if you are queuing for, say, two minutes, you'll get a little notice it'll pop up on your screen saying, do you want to be a VIP for the day? 50 quid, type in your code, away you go. You know, everyone else in the audience, everyone else in this queue hates you, but you don't care because you're already in. Uh, and then you, and so there is that natural add-on, but if, if I'd stood in the queue for, for so long, it, that shouldn't bankrupt my company along the way. Guys, anything else to add to that? And, uh, and we, or we can uh, see if we could squeeze in one more question if uh, anybody else has got a question they'd like to put. Gentleman at the back there, yes, please, your name and your uh, organisation, please. Hi, John Sanders from GES. Um, obviously, you're talking about AR and VR. Is there a danger, you think? Um, well... I believe there's a danger that sometimes clients get obsessed with the idea of engaging with the new technology and that drives the engagement rather than the engagement objectives. Be interested to hear your views. I think that's kind of the most important point to all of this and all the kind of different types of tech is not to fit the tech to the client, like kind of go, go and see, okay, right, what do I want to achieve as we, as we keep saying and then say, right, okay, well, we've got VR, let's not just try and chuck something into it because it's going to be low quality and the consumer isn't necessarily going to like it and it's going to be boring and then you kind of, it's counterproductive in the first place. So it's about finding the right solutions which are going to fit and be valuable rather than just going straight for the tech and pushing things forward as quickly as possible. Anybody yeah, exactly. else, it's a, Yeah, all about the value at the end of the day and we, we work by principles of, of three Cs. It's got to be the right uh, context, it's got to be the right content and then you've got to have the right call to action as well. Um, and if that call to action... Um, you know, has true value for all stakeholders, then, um, yeah, it's a win. Um, we are going to be talking later on today in one of our sessions about, as I said, distraction or enhancement. And I think very much that question is, is not just relevant here with the VR and the AR stuff, but with technology in general. So it'd be interesting to see what our panel later on this afternoon make of, of that same question, perhaps, um, on an overall basis and not just directed to AR and VR and whether or not we're wandering around events like zombies instead of speaking to people. Um, it is time to wrap up the first of this afternoon's sessions um, and thank our guests, first of all. Um, from Zappa, please give a round of applause to uh, Mr. Stephen Richard Spong from Zappa. Stephen, thank you for joining us. From Sledge, Ross Easterbrook. James Lawrence from Doozer, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. And Carl Bresnahan, that's twice. <laughs> From, uh, from Interglow. Carl, thanks for your, for your input. Don't forget to keep the questions coming via Glitter and via the hashtags this afternoon. Um, that has been our first event tech talk. Thank you very much for tuning in. <laughs>